Hello, everyone, and welcome to Women in Construction Week. Uh, my name is Katie Williams, and I am a Vice President of Product Development at Innate. I've been in the industry for over 15 years, um, and I'm so excited to be here with a wonderful panel of ladies today. Um, and our topic is Building Beyond Boundaries, the Impact of Women Shaping the Industry. A couple house, uh, housekeeping tips. Uh, so the platform is going to have several customization options for you. So you can move windows around, make them bigger, drag the corners. So play around a little bit with the tools. Um, you are automatically muted just so that you know, um, and we are recording this. Um, so if you wanna watch it later, you absolutely can do that. And if you're experiencing any issues, feel free to use that chat feature. And then if you have any questions, there's a Q&A box. So please put those in there. I will try to incorporate those questions in. Um, otherwise, we'll save a little bit of time at the end, but I will try to incorporate those in as we go. We'll also do some polls during our, um, our, you know, our webinar here. So um, please engage in those too. We wanna know what you're thinking. So let's get started. We'll do a round of introductions. Um, oh, actually I missed a slide, sorry about that. Um, just for anyone not familiar with Innate, we are a, um, a cloud software provider that provides integrated solutions. We provide a solution for the end-to-end -end, you know, life cycle of a construction project, bringing together cost, scope, and schedule. Um, so have you know want any more information about that feel free to reach out to us you can visit our website or you know reach out to us as well through that chat function and i think we're ready to kick it off for some introductions all right let's go ahead and we'll start with you tracy do you want to introduce yourself sure hi i'm tracy black um i'm the cfo for interflow uh interflow is a construction company pipeline infrastructure it's got about 650 people um, in it, 13% I think are um, women. Uh, I've been here in the construction industry for about 18 months, but prior to that worked across multinationals with, uh, within manufacturing tech um, and a very male dominated industries wherever I've been. Um, I'm a CPA and MBA and I rec recently graduated from the Australian Institute of Company Directors. Awesome. Congratulations. And looking forward to all of your insight from your experience. Uh, uh, Josie, do you want to introduce yourself? Kia ora koutou. I'm Josie Fitzgerald. I'm the General Manager of Land and Water for Oricon in New Zealand. Uh, we're an organisation that does engineering, design and advisory services in the infrastructure sector. Uh, I've been in the industry around about 28 years. Um, I started my career as a land surveyor, spending many days out on sites, both greenfield and construction sites. Um, I actually had a passion for high-rise buildings set out for some reason. I think I love the accuracy required. Uh, I've always worked in the infrastructure sector, and particularly in residential land development, uh, the defence sector and the built environment market. Uh, in my time um, with the organisation, I've had many roles in my career. So tech technical people and uh, team and project leadership, business development, client relationship, leadership, so forth. Um, I'm an owner in Oricon uh, and I'm one of Oricon's top 50 leaders. Um, I'm, and like I said, I'm now general manager of our land and water business, which has got around about 200 people across New Zealand and into Manila. Um, just a little bit about me, I think I've got three uh, teenage girls um, and I'm a full-time working parent. Um, I, I, I think a couple of projects really stand out to me and I think this kind of shapes who I am, but I, I worked on the survey definition of the border between Ethiopia and Eritrea and experienced the lives and landscapes of, of rural Africa. Um, as well, I led our global environment and planning team for a time, which included Africa, Australia and New Zealand. And I think what I learned about this was um, that I like, I've got a hunger for change. I like broadening my horizons and traveling and meeting new people. Uh, finally, I am a passionate advocate for females in the infrastructure sector, and that's why I'm here today, be it engineers, surveyors, architects, advisors, constructors. I think diversity is critical in the design and delivery of um, infrastructure, and uh, both for our homes, our cities, our places of work and our environments. Uh, I'm the chair of the Diversity Agenda here in New Zealand, which is an organisation set up 
by industry to, to drive diversity into the engineering and architecture professions for better outcomes for all. So I'm really excited to be here today to share my experiences and insights with you all. Thanks, Katie. Yeah, Josie, that was a fantastic intro. And I'm really, I think, you know, especially talking about your personal, you know, I, thank you for sharing that. And I think that a, a lot of our listeners will be really interested to hear about, I don't love the word balance, but how you've integrated, right, your, your working life, your professional life and your personal life. So I'm really looking forward to digging into that. Um, thank you. Uh, Jillian, will you introduce yourself? Uh, well, hi, hello everybody. I'm thrilled to be here. So my name is Gillian Formenton and I'm a chartered mechanical engineer. I'm also chartered in engineering leadership and management. And I am talking to you from Western Australia today in the middle of Perth. Um, I work for Clough. Uh, Clough is a, a, a national engineering and construction company. We've been recently acquired by the WeBuild Group. So we're going through some really exciting times and now I've got to reach into all corners of the planet. Uh, which is really great. Um, I am, uh, well, I, I graduated over 32 years ago now, which that seems like a really big number. So, I, and I've worked in a number of different parts of industry. I started in Tasmania. I grew up in Southern Tasmania and began my career in earnest in the gas industry. Um, you know, like every good young engineer in the gas industry, like Perth is the place to be. I only intended to stay here for five years um, but that was 27 years ago, and I met the man of my dreams who came along with four daughters. So I am the stepmother of um, four of the most incredible women I know, and I'm also a grandmother of five young boys. So oh, one's a young man and then four young boys. So I, I'm also a huge advocate for women um, pursuing whatever their heart yearns for, and I've been actively working on helping um, remove barriers to STEM careers for women my whole career. Uh, you know, one of the questions I'm often asked is, wow, engineering and you're a woman, how did that happen? So I've created a whole lot of answers to that question over the years, but it's also helped me inquire into, well, why would we not want to be in an incredible um, career like this? And I'm, I'm committed that people have a whole range of choices. And one of the platforms I use for that is Engineers Australia. I'm a, a big voluntary leader of Engineers Australia. Um, here in Western Australia, but also um, on the National Congress for the last couple of years. So, yeah, very happy to be here today, and I'm really looking forward to inquiring about um, this important topic. Yeah, th that was all great. Thank you so much, everyone, for your very good, nice, thorough introductions. That's fantastic. Um, so we're going to try. We have a few themes that we want to hit on. I think we, when we were preparing for the webinar, a topic we talked about was just in general these career chapters or how you know you kind of move through these phases in your career and so I think my first question to all of you is what are some of the key milestones in your career that got you to where you are today you know I think you know, Tracy in the role that you are and the executive role that you're in and how did being a woman impact that how did that influence it how you know was that ever a for your role or was it a challenge? Did you feel like being a woman held you back? And I think maybe if we start on some of that, the path to your current role and the path to your success and how has that shaped your journey and your career chapter, I think is a great place to start. And I don't know, Tracy, I, I called you out specifically, which was... wasn't very fair, but if you want to go first. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let me let me have a go because th these guys are really eloquent. They'll be able to mop up um, any disaster that I start with. But um, I, I think um, when I reflect back, the you know the the younger years, it was I think it was male female agnostic. Um, but what I have noticed is once you do get to the more senior positions, that's when you really start to know and notice the the you know, some of the challenges that I think we as women all face. Um, in terms of my career path, I've always been laser focused on being an accountant, being a CFO. So in some ways, I feel like I've just cheated because that's a really easy, you know, that's a goal to go for. It's really clear. And you just, uh, you know, how do you get there? You just keep going after your boss's job. That's essentially, you know, how I thought I would go. But I would say that one of the key things that I did through this period was, you know, because I actually left school when I was 16. And um, so getting all of the qualifications and um, the education that I have probably over a 
20 year period um, as a mature age student and after hours and as a mother of two children, uh, that's really where um, a lot of my extra energy went um, through my career. And I've, prob I've been a CFO now probably for the last six or seven years um, and, and just worked my way up in, in that way. Uh, let's see, Jillian, I think you're off yeah. mute. So I don't know, do you want to chime in there? No, I can and definitely. I just, it's a really, really great question. Um, I've had a number of career chapters and um, every one of them has been um, building towards um, creating, I think what I have, I look at it as like the biggest set of choices to make the biggest difference I can. So I, I've, I've always hated that question, you know, where do you want to be in 10 years or where do you want to be in five years? I, but I do set very clear intentions for the kind of difference that I want to make. And, I, I, you know, like sometimes I go, well, which industry do I want to be in? Or um, where, where do, what, who are the kind of people that I want to work with? I often look for, well, what are, the, what are the kind of problems I want to solve? You know, like, and as an engineer, I mean, I'm an engineering director with Clough, which has been an extraordinary opportunity to work with a company going through massive changes. Like when you, you know, we we went through some fairly difficult times, like many companies have in the construction industry, and then to be acquired by a, a company that's quite different from Clough, and although we have worked alongside WeBuild um, for a long time, um, the opportunity to work with people and create um, some ease in those interfaces. You know, so, and when I look back at my career, that's often the kind of role that I've been in. You know, I've been in um, projects that are bringing people together to do really great things. So, yeah, that, and that, so, you know, like in terms of the journey I'm on, um, I'm, you know, like, again, I'm looking for where I can make the biggest difference, but also, looking for the kinds of ways that I can maybe make a unique difference so that I can continue to um, promote myself and, and where I and where I can um, move forward in my career. Do you think that do you think that women struggle to see themselves or set those goals or career like some of the career progression for themselves in this industry? Like I, and I know I do. We do want to do a poll that's sort of are, sort of around this topic. But do you think that? And I think we can go ahead and put out the poll, and then we can keep talking about it. But I, I am curious. Do you think that that like you know, Tracy, you said you you knew you wanted to be a CFO, but do you also feel that sometimes maybe there's a lack of the representation, or if you don't see someone in those roles, that then you're not even setting your sights on those. Some sometimes some of the roles or have trouble coming up with the career path or plan. I could be speculating. Yeah, I look, I think curious. not having those, yeah, those female representations at the at the top level, it's definitely been difficult uh, to, you know, what, what's that saying that um, you can't be what you can't see? And I really actually um, do think it's so important. And we'll probably touch on quotas and things later, but, you know, having that representation, that female uh, representation at the top, I really, I think it's, mm -hmm. it's critical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just think too like that the. So we got. I'll just I'll just keep going. Um, one of the things I just thought of then, Tracy, was you know, we as human beings we we make really good risk managers. We're always looking at what are the risks and and is it safe for me? And I, and I think having senior women that we can see that can help guide the way can reduce that experience of it feeling like it's too risky. Um, of course, you know, we make big decisions when we choose our next career step and we want to win. We, do, we certainly don't want to fail. Um, and if we're too concerned about that or we don't see that we've got a kind of something guiding us forward or someone or, or, or people that we can see that have succeeded before us, it, it, can, it can make it harder. Yeah, I, yeah that's, that's a good point. Josie, you were going to jump in there too. Yeah, I was just going to my own experience you know when I when I first started out there was very few female senior females in in my world around me which was probably my local office at the time uh, 28 years ago well, the rest of the world wasn't quite as visible as those around you but um, o over the years um, so I didn't see and I couldn't see how I could progress forward and I think I just you know spent that time learning my technical trade and and getting better and doing the things around me that everyone else was doing but 
but over the years um i've there's been there are a lot of female senior females in my organization both here in new zealand and in australia and and i know notice now we've got a new zealand managing director who's female and it's made a huge difference to me and my even my own confidence um and i can see myself you know all of a sudden i was like i could maybe i could aspire to that role now you know whereas before I just thought I hadn't really thought about it so I honestly think it does make a um a difference to you know you can be what you can see <laughs> to your point Tracy mm -hmm. and and maybe to elaborate on the question does it also matter to have women peers I mean not so not just in the leadership roles because I do think that like you said that is definitely very important but what about also who you're working with and who you're collaborating with. I mean, how often are you all the only woman in the room? We've just, in, um, as part of the diversity agenda here in New Zealand, celebrated a project where um, the National Archives building in Wellington, where all of the senior people on the project were females. And it was like, this has never happened before. And it was, a, it was, um, it was really noteworthy and I think you know that the we actually had a presentation and a discussion about it, and and they all talked about the the close collaboration, the relationships that they built on the project, and that the, and the client was sharing in the success and and saying that it actually was a really successful project because of you know the open collaboration that went on. So, I'm not saying it doesn't happen elsewhere, but in that example, it was definitely obvious and 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 valued. So that's kind of neat too. Yeah. And we, we're doing pretty well at Clough, we're just reflecting on what it's been like over the last 32 years. Um, it definitely, it, it's changed. Like early on, um, yeah, I was, I was like, you can imagine too, like in, in the, down in southern Tasmania 32 years ago, it was really quite an anomaly to have a, a young woman on the engineering teams. And, um, and, you know, like I felt like, you know, a little bit of a freak sometimes. Um, it certainly has improved over the years, and here at Clough, we, we've certainly got a huge commitment to um, gender equity at Clough, and we've been really successful. Like, we've got about 20% of our engineering um, professionals um, are, are women. Now, that's certainly concentrated at the younger end of the scale, and, and we, you know, we, we have less senior women, um, but you'd expect that as well. Um, but it's actually rare now for me to be in a meeting with no women. I'm just thinking like that it's certainly changed a lot over the last years and it does make a massive difference. Like there are more perspectives available. I notice I don't have to be as careful. I don't edit my thinking as much. I don't have to test the water before I speak as much as I used to. So I think that's, that's really, that's really good. Yeah, that's, um, and I don't know, Tracy, if you wanted to say something, I really quick wanted to get our other poll up because we're asking specifically if there are women representation in leadership, but just to touch really fast on the poll that we had asked, Tracy, you actually are the one that said when we were prepping that you look at the makeup of an organization before going to it. And I, for me, that was really eye opening. And I mean, I haven't changed jobs in a long time. So, you know, I, I hadn't really considered it, but I think, you know, for anyone on the call, I think how important to hear that this is something that women are considering. And, you know, if you're someone looking to retain or attract talent, knowing how important that decision is and that we put the results up, up here, but I do want Tracy to be able to give her thoughts. But I mean, it does, you know, it does look like it could potentially be something that somebody's considered. Obviously there's other factors that, you know, that's the results from the poll, but it's definitely something that women are thinking about is who's working there? Am I going to be represented? Um, and, and so I thank you for everyone for participating in the poll. And, and Tracy, I don't know if you wanted to share any more thoughts, but um, we also will do another poll too, if you want to participate in that one. Uh, all I would say is I absolutely, and probably for the last 10 years have, uh, I probably had about 10 jobs in, in my career and um, definitely the last couple I would go on and look at every company and see who their executive team are. Actually, any company I deal with now even, I look at that because, and, you know, it's very judgmental and probably not very generous of me, but I make a judgment when I see that. And I, you know, going into a new company, I think, yeah, I know what this place is going to be like if they don't have women at those executive levels or if they're not, you know, highlighting. And it's real. 
it's 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 real um if there are women on these in these roles it's it's a different culture i'm not saying that i don't take the jobs when when there isn't but i have to say that um i certainly am judgmental as i go go into it yeah a question i ask myself is Sorry, Katie. Uh, yeah, a question I ask myself is, is, is will my voice be heard here? Uh, how hard will it be to be able to make the difference I want to make? When I speak up, am I, you know, are there going to be people listening? Now, you can, I mean, that can be the case even if there are senior women in the business, depending on, on the, you know, so you want to do your research and even if you can meet people or, or read things about them um, because it's your, your, ability to be to be heard that's going to make the difference and we've got some terrific men in our business you know like the best and they you know some of them have really oriented their careers to make a difference in this particular area and they're doing the work to make sure that they are listening and they get coaching and they they work with some with people that can help them um make that available so yeah i i wouldn't i wouldn't urge people to kind of just just look and then kind of go look there's not enough you know, not enough long hair in that picture, um, but, um, because you've got to you've got to be smart about it. But yeah, like if you can see that there are women being successful though and are elevating to those higher roles, then that's a pretty that's a pretty good um, signal that you are more likely to get heard in that organisation. And and I'll say like you know I took this job and there was no women in in the role, but there was a you know, there was an appetite for change. There were values. There were um, there was a growth trajectory. There was a young MD, and um, and you know now we talk about oh, is this role available? You know, were there any women that applied for an exec role? And you know, and and we basically now I think our um, so we have two women in the exec team out of seven, which actually isn't too bad um, for such a you know very male dominated industry and i don't josie i don't know if you wanted to add on anything to that before we moved on no i think just going back to your earlier question though which kind of ties us all together for me around those different chapters in your career um i i've read a really good book recently by jenny romity who um called good, good power and that she talked about it as we, uh, me, we, and um, and us, and and that was really just about um, me. You know, like I spent the first part of my career really, like I said, honing my craft and and kind of like, you know, um, everything was kind of about me and and kind of advancing myself. And then I went into this really tricky chapter, which is about we, and that's like I'm in a leadership position in a business. I became an owner. I started a family and all of this stuff. And you probably got my first mortgage. So everything happens at the same time, right? And it's um, and it's a really, really um, tricky part of your life. And I think one of the things that, um, that I really um, had to do there was, was kind of, um, I thought I could do everything, and I and I kind of did, but I ended up doing a lot of stuff um, without a lot of stuff. Probably not very well. It probably was okay, let's be honest. But I, you know, to my own and my own high standards, so I ended up having to kind of peer back a few things and and actually go. I'm going to put that on hold. I'm not going to take that leadership role. I'm just going to focus on, you know, being a good um, project leader or client person and and look after my kids for a bit and that sort of stuff. Um, so I, I suppose I just want to acknowledge a lot of people are in that. That's quite a long stage of your career, right? And we go through that for quite a long time. Um, I think I'm coming out the other side with, with teenage girls. They kind of look after themselves a little bit, but um, but then that's when you get into that us thing. And for me, the, the, the diversity of gender in, here in New Zealand is one of those things where I think I'm trying to change industry now. I want us to, to do better. So yes, I'm in my organisation and trying to do more there, but I've, it's kind of coming to that point where I want to, you know, spread my wings more and look and, and help to try and uplift the whole of industry. So I just thought it was neat, that kind of thing around chapters, which I think Gillian, you started off talking about and just kind of compartmentalizing it like that um, and acknowledging that they're all quite different and um, we'll all be at different stages. Mm. Yeah, I, I don't know the most eloquent way to say it. And I know that we're going to talk a little bit about like the balance of balance, integration, whatever the right word is with family. But it's um, like the alignment of your 
as a woman of your professional and personal, right? Because you go through those stages of having kids, right? I mean, the challenge that like your coworkers and your bosses assume that you will have if you decide you want to have a family and how that also like the timing just doesn't necessarily always work out with where you're likely at from a career perspective. And again, we, we can dive into that a little bit more later, but how, like you're saying in this book, I mean, it's like these chapters also fall not necessarily always at the great time when you're in your personal life, right? Chapters, right? I feel like that's kind of what you're saying too, right? It's like you're right in the thick of very difficult things of proving yourself at work, but also personally too. Um, hmm. And I mean, I, I think we talked a little bit about it when we were prepping and for women, sometimes you feel that more um, because sometimes that burden gets put on women more from like a child like, taking care of children perspective and all that. And we can dive into it more now, or we can, I know that we, I didn't share the results of the poll. So I don't know if anyone has strong thoughts before we, I share those results, but um, I, otherwise I do think that wraps up our, our, our career chapter as well. Okay, so it does look like we, um, we it, it's uh, everyone that's attending, we have some good representation from women on the executive leadership team, which is fantastic. That's great. I had, um, I had seen like a recent stat too that said, I think it was for the US, I, I tried to look for something globally that said that like women's representation in construction and, and the executive leadership was up to 40%. And it previously had been closer to like that 10 to 12, which is also good news. Um, so I do think things are moving in the right direction, but maybe to tee up to the targets conversation we had, you know, is, is creating gender targets a good way to continue to get that representation, to get to a good place where we're, you know, seeing a better balance? What are your thoughts on having targets around gender? I think we have another poll I, question too. Sorry, Josie, I didn't mean to cut you off there, but that's all right. While the poll goes up, I can share some insights. I mean, I we we first started looking at this at Oricon around about twenty years ago. It was before I had my children, and way back then, we were seeing that females were dropping out of the industry at a, what we call a level five, six kind of level, which is probably like 10, 10, 12 years into your career. Whereas for men, it was about five or so years later where it started to dip away. And and so we, yeah, 20 years ago, we started to like look at this and look at what we could do and set up kind of women's initiatives and di different things. And then 20 years later, we're still, you know, talking about it. And, and we thought it would happen. And we itch, I honestly think that if, and I've actually seen some data around this. I think it's closing the gender pay gap. 256 years to close the gender pay gap at the rate we're going, right? So mm -hmm. I think without targets, you actually will get there, mm -hmm. but it's going to take us 256 years. So what we've done in our own organisation and, and with the um, at Oricon and then with the diversity agenda, we're talking about it as well, is putting targets in place. So not necessarily quotas, where well, they're not quotas, they're targets to, to help guide people and say this is, our expectation. We'd like to, we're currently at 33% at this level of females and we'd like to get to, you know, 38% this year and 41, you know, like, so, so they're achievable, aspirate, but they're also aspirational and ultimately they'll get us to where we'd like to be, which is a representation of the community. So I 100% stand behind targets. I think they're an absolute necessity because we won't get there without them. Yeah, I could add to that too, because I, I agree completely that we need to have the numbers in front of us. And this is the way I think about it. I like a good sporting analogy. Imagine watching, I don't know, my, I love watching Australian rules football. It's a great sport, right? But imagine how boring all that kicking and running and handballing and even, you know, like all of that would be if there wasn't a scorecard. You know, like if the scorecard gives us the game to play, you know, and in those moments where we have the opportunity to make a decision to do go one way or another, if we've got a clear communicated scorecard, we can um, we can show up where maybe we we've got weaknesses. You know, otherwise you think about the end of the football game, they'd all get in the locker room, they go, "How was the game? Oh, we had fun, but there's actually no idea about what actually happened." The, you know, and the, what happens in a football game, the thing that matters is the score. So I don't know if it's a particularly good analogy, but it, it gives me some freedom about it because yeah, quotas seem hard. It's, it almost sounds like it's unfair. We're going to give people opportunities who don't deserve it. And all of that kind of world comes up when we think of quotas. Um, but 
in the world of a scorecard, it gives us the game to play that's going to keep us going in the direction that we all say is the better one, which is diverse teams with uh, you know, big different perspectives, um, equity for all, choice for everybody. They're all the things that we know is not only good for people, it's good for business. And it, it gives us that game to play. Yeah, I, love, I love that. I, a, a great way to put it, a great example. If I could just say, like, talk about it too, because I, I think quotas are essential. Quotas, targets, whatever we want to call it, because because it isn't an, e an even playing field. Um, the jobs that, that I could go for uh, with my, you know, professional qualifications and my diverse experience, you know, I could be in an interview with several other men and um, when they process it as who are we going to choose, these people are all equal, and then they, they picture me sitting in the boardroom table with them or the the men I, I do think that the final decision often is is an emotive one rather than a, a perfectly uh you know perfectly data driven or you know without that sort of bias um it may sound that, I, that i'm being bitter but i but i honestly think without the quota there is no reason to go there there is there is no reason to say okay well Let's start to build this sort of more female representation, and um, also feel grateful in this industry that we're in too. Because the, I don't know about all of you, but the certainly the water authorities that we work with in Interflow, um, you know, and, and all the government agencies, they have criteria that we we have to report on. It's part of our tender processes, um, so they're also helping to drive this change. And, you know, I think that it's important and um, I'm really happy about that. I think another point, um, interestingly, you've you've got past legislation where, where um, I don't know exactly, but the, the gender pay gap reporting right is now coming out. And what you'll see with that is um, that whilst you may have pay equity and like for like roles and that could be you know spot on and there's no pay there's no pay equity gap um the gender pay gap is is significantly swayed when there's more men in more senior positions in an organization and you'll and um you'll see that that sways it quite significantly and i know in our organization it's it's it's, it's showing up um until you get more females at an equal number or similar number your pay gap is always going to be uh, a part. And now that that's been reported publicly, I think targets are only going to go one way to help towards closing that pay gap, which is now published. That was really good. Thank you. Um, okay, so we're going to switch gears just a little bit. Um, I We did get a couple questions, so I'm going to try to incorporate those in. I think maybe moving to the more of the work-life balance, I think would be good. And um, I saw a really good, I liked this quote um, from a woman named Jennifer Todd. She's a founder and president of a, a, a contracting company, but she said, the biggest challenge of being a woman in construction is the constant reminder that you are a woman in construction. And I, I thought that was kind of perfect. Um, so I'm, I'm curious because I, I think this will relate to a question we were asked too. What has been the most challenging part about being a woman in the industry, and are there are there any is there anything you can think of that would change that? I think one um, of the I most challenging probably... things for you go, me, Chilean. Sorry about that. Um, one of the most challenging things is the assumptions that people make on your behalf uh, as a female. So, um, and I can remember this happening to me when I wasn't even. A, a parent and my boss at the time just decided that I wasn't going to be able to be a team leader because I would leave and have babies and I was like I found out from a colleague and um, I thought that was wildly unfair one because I did want children but I didn't know if I could have children it turns out it was quite hard to have kids who knew that um, but the <laughs> fact that actually I didn't know if I was going to stay for a long time you know like take time off or no I mean who knew? So I, I confronted this person and they were kind of like, oh, then they admitted they'd put their own experience with their wife who left work and took time out to raise their family 
into their thinking around what I would do. And so I think, I mean, that still happens. I mean, maybe not to that same extent, I hope, but, you know, people make assumptions that maybe someone won't want to travel because they've got a young family or whatever without actually involving others in the conversation. So I think it's really, really important to, if you ever see that, to call it out because that's unfair. People should be able to have the same um, you, opportunities uh, no matter who they are, what they are and what their life experiences are because who knows, they may want to get out of that situation that they're in and that looks, that would be a great example. Um, and just the other thing I wanted to add into this around the work-life balance, I think the most positive impact I've seen in my time is the change in policies uh, which are now becoming more open, equally open to, to all parents whether they're male female or non-gender to be able to take time off to look after young families I think that's the one of the one things one of the key things that's leveled the playing field in terms of promotion because more and more men and, and um, non-females are taking time out of the workplace to raise families uh, whereas previously it was female. So it was impacting us more and more in our career progression than others. So I think those two things are what I've seen and then one's negative and one's positive. I, I think that's great. And I wanna give Jillian and Tracy both an opportunity to answer as well. And another question that came in and maybe you could answer this as you answer too, was how do you handle the, the promise of work-life balance, but then the, the demand an expectation to like work extra hours and work overtime and, and, you know, like being a single parent uh, from this industry's perspective, how do you think that that can be addressed? Um, because it does feel, I mean, I, I know I hear from fellow, you know, peers and things like that, that it still very much feels like an industry that supports the one working single, you know, person household, single working person household versus, you know, the, the, the makeup that we have today, which is not that. So I'm curious, you know, if you have any other thoughts and could maybe address that part of the question too. Uh, yeah, I've got a few thoughts about that because it's certainly something that I've had to deal with throughout my career. Um, you can imagine with, you know, a instant family of stepchildren and step teens they were at the time. And um, so this is my this is my advice. You, if you're gonna, if you are gonna be someone in life who who says puts her hands up and says, "Hey, count me in, count me in. I want to make a difference. I want to be counted on. I want to produce results. I want to live the biggest life I can." Right. So you, you know, I, I imagine most of the people on this call have probably said words a little bit like that at some point. The first thing that you want to be really working on is you want to really develop the relationship with your word, your promises, like what you actually say that you're going to do. And then, and look, this is not an easy journey. I've had lots of coaching and mentoring and um, with, you know, to, to make this difference is when you say that you're going to do something, it, it's not to run yourself completely ragged, keeping all your promises. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying develop yourself as someone who can honor your word. You're going to break promises, right? If you have your attention on your relationships and making sure you're keeping those relationships clean that is that is the best foundation for everything now i'm also not saying you've got to be friends with everyone that will also wear you out when i say relationship i don't mean being friend friendly necessarily or that it can include that it's what is the relationship for like who am i in the relationship who is that person in the relationship what are we out to accomplish together and then and, and work on that so if you are you know faced with conflicting um, challenges, which you will, if you're if you're someone who's up to making a big difference, you're going to have so many competing and conflicting um, commitments all the time. It it will keep you sane and also keep your reputation um, and also keep you well if you can um, develop a really good relationship to what you say you're going to do. And then when things maybe go a bit off, get in communication, say what you are going to do or by when the timeline's going to slip by what you can do, what you can't do, what you're willing to do, what you're not willing to do, and, and keep that dialogue going. Um, it does take coaching and training. Um, find people who you admire that do that well and buy them lots of cups of coffee and have them share with you how they do that and how they, how they honour those relationships in a way that keeps, keeps things going in the right direction. I love that. I mean, you're, like building that foundation of credibility, that's such a good, a, like a good piece of advice. 
before I move to the next question, I don't know, Josie, did you, oh, Tracy, were you going to throw something else in oh, there? Oh, look, look like... I just wanted to say, wow, Julian, that was, that was inspirational. Yeah. All, all I was going to say was, um, you know, part of this will become less difficult when we have more women in the senior leadership positions. I, I think, thank heavens for COVID and the technical revolution that that brought about, because before that, all the organisations I worked in never thought that you could work from home. Um, so bravo for that. Um, but, but yeah, women in leadership, I know I've got a full finance team here of women and, and one man, and they have young children and just my empathy and my understanding of their situation. Um, I, you know, I know that they're supremely grateful for, um, will there be overtime? Am I demanding? Do I want things? Yes. But Work-life balance, I don't think, means you don't do any overtime. I think work-life balance, you need to... It, it's about that flexibility because, you know, I used to work um, like with, with the US, so I'd be online at 10 o'clock at night. That would be awesome, actually, because my kids had finally gone to bed at that point. But I would leave work earlier. You know, it's it's actually just making sure that you you tackle what you, you know, you, you take on what you think is important um, and you can't do it all and don't do it all and don't sign up for it all exactly as Gillian said. Yeah, I think another thing, um, just to, just to kind of um, add it to that, I haven't got any really wise words, but I think one of the things that you need to do and I, and we're probably all guilty of it is actually making space for yourself because you end up working and looking after your family and all those things. And I think you always end up last, right? And so actually over, you know, I've learned that, but it's taken me a long time. So make sure you have discipline to set aside a little bit of time for yourself because you need to look after yourself and all of this. And you're worth it. That's what I would always yeah. say. I'm worth it. <laughs> this is about me. Well, and if you ever notice too that the most difficult promises are the ones that you, the, the difficult promises to keep are the ones you make to yourself. I'll say that like I'm 99% reliable for anything in my diary that involves another human being. The things that are just me, uh, not so reliable. Like So I have to, and that's something I'm really continuing to work on like that. And that's often that self-care, making sure we've got time to do the things that matter. So yeah, that's a really good point. And well, and you're not very good at your job probably if you're not taking care of yourself, right? I mean, how no. you know what you're, how you're showing up definitely will be reflective of that. So. Yeah. Another good question that came in um, is when, like, when you've been working or getting promoted or moving to the next role, how impactful has another woman been in your journey? And that does kind of go into our mentoring that we wanted to hit on. But we are—I'm starting to get a little worried about our time. So, if, mm -hmm. if mentoring can weave into that a little bit, if if that makes sense. But you know, was wasn't another woman that was? Did another woman impact you at all on your journey or? Was it a man or, you know, who, who along the way helped encourage you? You know, maybe talk a little bit about that too. And I, I have been a mentor for a very long time and I've been a mentee as well. You know, and I think well, the first thing I just want to make sure I um, get this in here somewhere, be a mentor. Like I, I can't say that, you know, more. It doesn't matter how, how young you are. There are people who need your leadership and your guidance. And I think I've probably got more out of mentoring than I have being a mentee, because if my mentee asks something or needs some guidance, I will, as a matter of my honor, I will go and find out or will we'll deal with that for myself. I think that that can be really, really good. Uh, and then also help can come in all sorts of strange ways. In fact, hindrance can come in strange ways as well. Um, um, Find people who, who, if you're within an organisation particularly, find people whose success counts on you being successful. So if you're successful, then they'll be successful. And then it's, you know, again, it's creating that relationship so that so that you can um, really help them see how at, at stake they are in your success. And it sounds a bit manipulative, right? But it's actually just pure physics. <laughs> if if you're in a role where your results will produce results for that other person they're going to be not only a help to you, but they're going to bring resources. They're going to, they're going to recommend um, development and training. They're going to introduce you to people. 
um, and also you'll be become one of those people and you, the, who's um, who's known for producing success around them. So I think I think that can that can be a really useful way to look at it because you're not not in this on your own unless you're kind of sitting on an island and you're um, you really are just producing results in your own little company. Um, and you don't have clients, so that's obviously not going to work, right? <laughs> you, you're, you're part of a big organism, that, and everyone wants to be successful. So, yeah, find those relationships and those people who may be a bit more senior to you who, who will do better if, if you're doing better. And then make big requests of them for help. That's great. Yeah. I can add to that. Um, I think my... Like I said initially, my world around me, there wasn't many senior females. And I think my first, I actually did get a mentor out of um, one of our Australian parts of the business. And she uh, she was a, probably about 10 years older than me and was someone that was going through different life um, stages. But I, she was really great at kind of helping to share her ch the challenges she'd faced before me and how she overcame them. Um, I think, so she was probably my first mentor. Um, but, but since then, I've had... Um, male and female mentors and I think female uh, mentors or people around you are, are great because they, they are typically have not always but typically have gone through similar experiences and around life and family that you um and, and dealing with that from a female perspective um not saying there's not lots of great dads out there I, I suppose it's just um just that kind of perspective and and an angle and so I've found that really valuable and I, I would recommend anybody um at that stage of their life and in fact any stage of their life having a, a female mentor um to share those experiences but but the other thing i think around mentors and i know we're I'm moving into um into that now katie but finding someone that you can have a rapport with and i think i've the what's been good for me and helped me with my own leadership progression is having someone in a position of leadership that could help pull me up. Um, Jillian, you talked about this before, they were kind of like a sponsor. Um, they can, uh, you know, talk on your behalf when you're not there, you know, like they're advocating for you, they're sharing information to you that helps you to navigate your own way. So I think, um, I think both, you know, all sorts of diverse mentors are really, really useful and for different reasons. And it's actually good to have obviously more than one at any one time um, uh, throughout your career and sometimes more than one at once. Um, I'm forever grateful for the wisdom that they've all imparted to me. So, um, yes, definitely mentors. I'm a huge fan. And I'm a mentor myself. Yes, Gillian, I am. Do you see anything to add before we move on to the next question? Or All I would say is I've never had a formal mentor, but I've always looked up to people, male and female, and sort of taken what I, what I, what, you know, what resonated with me from them. I did have two um, amazing female CFOs in um, throughout my career, and um, you know, just sort of emulating them, getting their advice, talking to them, sort of outside of just day to day work. Um, I, I think is is invaluable. Um, certainly with within my network, I actually think networking and sort of things like this, actually meeting other women maybe at your same level or, or whatever is also a really great opportunity. And if you get those opportunities, you know, dive into them because um, that's when you really work out, you know, um, where the opportunities are and, and, and how many great women there are out there. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. And I think sometimes society has a way of trying to almost pit women against each other. And so doing everything to not fall into that, like the competitive, you know, like mm -hmm. atmosphere sometimes and really banding together, I think as much as possible, I think is also really good. Yeah, I have never experienced um, that, that negative women thing about, you know, women are... I have never experienced that. Um, I'm sure lots of people have, but I, I don't know if that's a, a myth or <laughs> I'd like to call that out with Mythbusters because I'm not <laughs> sure. You know, I want to see where that exists. I, I've been working for a long time and I, I actually haven't experienced that. Yeah, I think that's oh, great that you haven't. Oh, I think there are a I few do. out there. I guess that. <laughs> 
I, I, <laughs> and I, was, I was like, I, def I definitely have, um, unfortunately. <laughs> And I definitely, I know I personally got caught in the trap of like feeding into it more. And on it, and then another woman gave me the feedback of don't be that woman. Don't, don't be that yeah. woman. And I, it was like, I was, oh my gosh, way to call me out. And I'm glad you called me out. And it changed, it changed a lot of things for me. So, but very immature. Uh, I think that's very immature. No, but I think we've all got it within us to be, to be that woman. And I, my, my, um, I guess my guidance to people who, um, who maybe have either found themselves like, oh my gosh, I'm I'm not being the way that I want to be, or maybe they've had some interactions that haven't gone really well. I think it's just to remember that, you know, most of us will interact. Um, sometimes we'll interact from fear, you know, like people will respond badly or will be bad with you, or might bring that that up in, in yourself when we're scared of something. So the more that you can articulate what the fear is, it might be fear of being minimized or fear of missing an opportunity or it's usually just fear of looking bad for some reason um, I think we've all got got it within us to get the fingernails out or whatever our our um, version of that would be but yeah it's it's good and surround yourself by people that will call you out like Katie that was a really good example like you had someone who said hey don't be that woman don't be that girl um, I, it, it's a, another really important part of my career has been I've deliberately surrounded myself with people who will call me out who will listen to me bigger than I'm ever ever listened to myself you know like I said the other day now you know when we were, when we got together like we're a, we're often a really um unreliable witness for what's possible for us but also what reality is so you know surround us surround yourself with people who will tell you how it is and give you guidance um and you know have that honest and authentic um interchange with you to to you know to keep reality <laughs> I think we have one last poll that we are putting out there and um, maybe for, for you ladies, if you have any thoughts on retaining women in the workforce. So, you know, like what are some things that organizations should be doing to keep women interested in the, in, in the industry? And I think it could also be to interest them to begin with, like how do, how do we encourage, encourage more women to enter the industry? and then also to stay. So I don't know if there's any thoughts about that. And we are a little short on time, so we might keep this one a little short. That way we can get to our last question. I got a really simple way this organization has started thinking about um, retaining women in the workforce and it's to get more women in. Um, I heard, you know, in one of our executive meetings talking about just you get that first woman in the team and then the rest will come and they will stay. I think it's all about numbers. And the like when you say that, do you also mean the cultural impact that that woman then has, like her ability, or, yeah, or you just mean because she's there and representing, that's going to start the change? Yeah, and usually they talk well about the company. Of course, you have to have the right structures in place, but no women, you, you don't want to be the pioneer, right? Because that's what it looks like if you're the only woman in that team or that crew or that office or that project team. You know, it, you it's obvious. So get more women in. Yeah, and I would add to that too, Tracy. Like, bring them in um, and make sure that they are in roles where they can make decisions. Um, there's I've seen a few times where we've had, you know, maybe some great women, but it's like you know, like the. Um, not part of decision making and it's that's that's not great that's worse that, that that would be worse than not not having her there right so yeah. i think we all want to be mindful of that we want to have our women be part of the fabric of the business don't have them as add-ons you know yeah. that's um that could be a bit of a trap it's, it's statistics can look good but if they're not if if they're not in there sharing their perspectives actually guiding the business in the ways that work for everybody, then um, it can be detrimental. So yeah, I'd, I'd add that. Like answering and I a think survey that... and never seeing any results from <laughs> what you, for what you, the feedback you provided. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Josie. Another, another thing, sorry to talk over you then, um, is the, I think providing um, leadership 
coaching, development, um, either within your organization, if your organization's large enough, and if it's not, there are some great programs out there available for um, women through, you know, uh, industry bodies and so forth. So I do think that's quite important um, to, ta- to, to specifically you know, draw out um, leadership abilities and um, really hone in on some of those attributes which might have traditionally been seen as male, you know, like the commercial tough negotiations and all that, um, you know, like hard conversations and, you know, the, the, the commercial kind of um, understanding and bringing, you know, we've, we've kind of tried to this program where bringing um, a plus one along. So bringing a female into a conversation which you might not normally for things like that, just to get them to upskill and um, and learn, um, and that yeah, just to build out build out that kind of rounded um, leadership kind of skills that might be needed in senior positions in an organisation. Yeah, that's, that's all great. Um, okay, so we are down to our last question, and I wanted to ask: um, so, what advice do you have for women that are in the industry? What's maybe what's the best piece of advice you've ever given or when you think back and reflect over your career, what is what's something that really stands out to you? If you had to just say one piece of advice, I mean, although there's already been really great pieces of advice throughout this whole thing, but if you had one more, what would it be? Um, I think it would be take the opportunities that are put in front of you, like take as many opportunities as you can without, you know, fill your cup learn from others, listen, ask questions, you know, really um, be a sponge. I'm here today learning from people, you know, and I'm learning a lot. I think we're always learning. So, um, yeah, key for me is, is taking opportunities that are put in front of you. Thank you. Yeah, I'd add to that, Josie. I'd say, yeah, say yes and then work it out. Like it's um, people want you to be successful uh, and sometimes particularly when it feels like they don't. Like if you're willing to put your hand up, be counted in and make promises about producing results, then you will have an, an untold amount of help coming your way. You know, so, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, there's been opportunities in my career that I haven't necessarily taken because I've allowed the concern for potential failure or looking bad to get in the way. Um, they're the bigger regrets than the roles I've taken on and they've not gone as well as maybe they could. You know, so, yeah, be bold, say yes work it out. If someone has offered you an opportunity, take heed more in what they think of your cap- capability than what your brain might be telling you right now. Oh, and go great. for it. And yeah. I think to add to that, don't over overthink it. Like, And don't try to overanalyze it. If someone has offered you an opportunity, you know, don't feel like you need to say all the pros and cons of why you can't do it. Just say yes. It's, you know, think that you can um, and don't be too hard on yourself, I think. Uh, and, and I think learn the business. So of all the things that we could do, I think the bit that we possibly don't do what because we're learning t- how to be leaders or how to exude confidence is learn the business. And I think if you learn that, it's, it's male, female agnostic. Yeah, mm-hmm. well, that's great. All right, well, we are out of time. Uh, I think I got to most of the questions. I apologize if I did not get to your questions. We really did get right up to the end. Um, Thank you so much for joining the panel, Tracy, Jillian, and Josie. It was great. I think we could have kept talking for a long time. I really appreciate your time, and thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, Please, you know, go out to innate.com, and you can learn more about um, our software and the solutions that we provide and we have additional webinars that you can always join at a later time too. And please give us some feedback about what you thought about the webinar. There should be a survey that comes up on the screen. So thank you so much and enjoy the rest of Women in Construction Week. Bye. Bye everyone. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.